G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Today we're going to be talking with Philippe Raboul about naphthenic base oils. Now, one of the things I've been trying to get across in this channel is that I just don't think that there is such a thing as good lubricants and bad lubricants. There are lubricants that are appropriate for your application and lubricants that you should be using in, a, in another application. And naphthenics is one of those things where it's, it's really good in a very specific niche. So let's talk about it. Thanks, Philippe, for um, being willing to, to join us today. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this, you know, naphthenics. Yep. Um, I probably don't have all that much experience with uh, naphthenic oils, and so I think I'm going to learn uh, a lot out of this session. Um, but first of all, could you please maybe introduce yourself? Um, how do you fit in with Moleculus and Ninas, or Ninas, as we, we say here in Australia? Um, and just give us a picture of, you know, your experience in the industry and how you came yes, to uh, uh... Moleculus. Thank you, uh, Rafael. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Philippe Roboul and um, I've been um, for the last uh, proof, uh, seven, eight years now involved in um, uh, naphthenic oil or probably even longer than that, actually. Um, and um, for the last two years, um, we've been called Moleculist as the exclusive distributor of uh, Ninus uh, Base Oils in, in Australia. And before that, we were in Australia, and I was a general manager here. So um, we, um, that's what we do. Um, now, perhaps uh, some more words about Ninas, but I, want, I know you want to shoot with some questions. So. No, no, no. A, a little bit about what, what uh, you know, yes. for people who are not familiar, how does, okay. how does Ninas or Ninas fit yeah, in with yeah, kind yeah. of the wider yeah, base oil yeah. market? That's right. That's right. There are a limited number of naphthenic basal producer around the world when compared to uh, the, the main basal that are what we call paraffinic basal. I'm sure we'll touch on that later. Uh, Ninus is a Swedish company, so based in Stockholm. Uh, they have uh, their refineries, two refineries, one in Germany. Uh, near Hamburg and uh, one not so far from uh, Stockholm in a place called uh, Ninasham. Uh, so that's the, the two refineries. And uh, since we're talking naphthenic oil, uh, you have to use naphthenic crude to do that. And, um, and hence why there aren't that many companies around the world doing naphthenic basil. It's more of a niche product. Yeah, okay. Um, before we get into the naphthenic crudes, um, I just want to, I mean, you you personally, uh, your career started in the paraffinic side, right? As I understand it. That's, that's correct. In, in the extra paraffinic side, because I was in the polyalpha olefin world. So, right. Uh, you know, I started as, a, as a, I guess, as a, a tribologist or an engineer uh, working in, uh, in PAOs. Uh, especially hands on the automotive side, because that's where the, the POs of the major market, uh, whether it's uh, PCMO or HGDO, you know, cars or truck and you know. Oh, cool. Cool. Well, um, I mean, just to get started, I mean, you mentioned uh, naphthenic crudes. Yes. Right. Um, and that, that I'm, you know, we'll get into this is the kind of feedstock for naphthenic base oils. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. Maybe if we could talk about the different types of crudes that are available around the world, just in general terms, yes, and, yes, and how that uh, sort of feeds into the two different base oil markets. Okay, okay. I'm I'm really not a crude specialist, yeah. so I'll I'll do it uh, in very uh, layman words, <laughs> very simple. Uh, you've got many types of crude. You know, crude crude oil is a natural product and comes in many many forms. So uh, if people think of um, uh, you know, chemistry and you put product A and B and you get product C and that's what you have. It's nothing to do with that when you talk uh, crude oil. It's just a mix of many, many different molecules, thousands or millions of them are all different. Uh, so those crude oils, however, have a, a, a kind of classification depending, people call them light crudes and heavy crudes and more paraffinic or, or naphthenic crude. Uh, paraffinic crude typically is, is a light crude. It makes a lot of fuel because fuel is um, in volume is what is uh, produced and consumed the most by, uh, uh, you know, and produced by refineries and consumed the most by the market. So traditional refineries from the big oil companies 
uh, are looking at uh, maximizing uh, fuel production. And so they want light crudes, light meaning it's smaller molecules, it's light fraction that will produce more fuel. Uh, in that, they can choose uh, if they decide to produce uh, base oil or not. So not every refinery makes base oil. Uh, and then, of course, at the bottom of the, the distillation column, uh, the, what the refinery makes usually uh, is uh, bitumen because uh, you have all the heavy grades left over, basically. And luckily, we've got plenty of roads to cover with bitumen. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Uh, if you take um, a naphthenic crude, it's a very heavy crude, uh, very hard to work with, uh, doesn't give much fuel, but it, gives, it can give a lot of naphthenic oil and a lot of bitumen. And actually, Ninus is a big bitumen company uh, in Europe. And, uh, and globally, it's a naphthenic oil uh, company. So you have, um, whether it's because people look for it or not, but you have, I think, a lot more um, paraffinic crude around the world than naphthenic. But you have naphthenic crudes um, uh, you know, in South America, in North America, in uh, the Middle East, you even have some in the Northwest Shelf of Australia, uh, in the North Sea. So they, there is an array of naphthenic crude. And, and again, each crude will be different. So it's not something you can just plug and play. Your refineries have to be pretty smart to uh, change from one crude to another. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've talked about that a little bit on this channel in the past when we talk mm -hmm. about mineral base oil classifications and things like that. Um, and the way that I've always found it easy to imagine is it's like, a, you know, the crude oil is like a box of Lego. Mm. You know, after you've, after you've made your set as a kid and you've broken it down into a whole bunch of pieces, it's just, it's this mass of all kinds of different shapes yes. and sizes. That's right. And refining is the, is the process of trying to group uh, pieces that are roughly yeah. the same. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. That's correct because... Uh, um, you know, without going into details, you have a distillation column and, and that distillates the fractions from uh, small molecules to very big ones. Uh, and that's what you do, uh, depending mm. on the ebullition point. Basically, you, you sort your, your molecules. Uh, yeah, I like the Lego analogy. I'll have to yeah. tell, tell my son about that. Is yeah, it, yeah. So, uh, Lego and, and, yeah, and maybe like just to because again, we have talked about this on the channel a little bit before. To distinguish mm -hmm. between what a paraffinic and what a what a naphthenic yes. looks like, because I usually draw the triangle. There's yes. there's paraffinic, yeah. naphthenic, and aromatic. That's right. right. That's right. Well, it's it's a simplification again yeah. because yeah. There, there'll be lots of other things. But basically, you you have I think would be fair that in a in a base oil you would have um, usually the three of them. Uh, and now, of course, if you go to group two and group three. Uh, oils and they've uh, they've more recent technologies in the last few decades where they really push it to a, a 99% uh, paraffinic, mm. but otherwise uh, the traditional group one oil or naphthenic oil will be a mix of all. You want me to draw something on the board? Yeah, why not? Why not? Okay. Just, uh, I mean, because because I've shown so, it in the past briefly. is the paraffins are basically a straight chain alkane That's right. or alkene. Um, That's right. And whereas you know your your aromatics have the aromatic rings they look like yes like benzene rings and, and that's right that's exactly right yeah. so if i draw here typically you'll have a, um you know this is paraffinic structure and you may have some branching of course and if you want to call it we can say it's isoparaffinic but basically think of a tetris game or a, a branch and a stick you know uh, and that's that's the paraffinic and then if you go to naphthenic, it still be a saturated. So what's important is it's saturated. There are no double bonds in there. And so you have a, it starts with a, a um, paraffinic chain. And then somewhere you'll have a ring, for instance, of five. I'm sorry, my geometry is not too good. And then it may continue with, with other uh, chain structure. And you could even have mixture of everything so that would be a typical naphthenic molecule okay it means you've got the rings saturated rings and then you've got the aromatics and the aromatics will come down to uh, our very well-known friends of uh, if you remember school where you've got the benzene ring and that's what you find in, in aromatics and uh, 
etc. So that, that would be the aromatics. And those means you have a double bond here. And that double bond is uh, susceptible to, uh, to break. And that's what causes oxidation. Hmm. So, of course, um, they all have different properties. Uh, this is not something you want in a lubricant uh, too much because it will oxidize, it will deteriorate. Um, those are a lot more stable. Um, now, uh, you can find molecules that will be a blend of all those three. Hmm. So, actually, it starts with a very long paraffinic chain, isoparaffinic, and then it comes to a, a, a naphthenic ring or two or three, and then it continues and have some... Uh, aromatic stuck on it so you can already start to get the complexity of a base oil made from crude oil uh, there is no molecule two molecules the same basically they're all a little bit different which makes it very hard actually to measure if you want to measure the uh, aromatic naphthenic and and paraffinic content mm. um, there are roughly three methods all more or less based on the same algorithm and they give you different results <laughs> depending depending what they want to to measure uh so you get a, an approximate number and uh, yeah that's a common discussion in the in the industry when you start looking at the properties yeah right so maybe we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll i'll tail into the properties discussion yes. uh, in a second but maybe one of the questions that just occurred to me was um you described uh the paraffinic crudes are maybe more widely used around the world especially yes. because they make good fuels, mm -hmm. right? Now, one of the conversations that we've had on this channel is the way that with COVID, that completely disrupted the base oil market. And uh, yes, the majority of that came out of the fact that most of the base oil refineries, mm -hmm. they're heavily dependent on the economics of fuel. And yes. so with fuel demand being very low, that affected base oil demand. Now, exactly. you're saying with naphthenics, Obviously, it's not as fuel dependent, right? Because it's mostly that's correct. Naphthenic base oil right. and bitumen. Yes. So, what kind of changes did you guys see in the market being a naphthenic yeah. base oil supplier? So that's that's a really good point, uh, Rafi. You're, you're spot on. Um, basically, and you say the fuel demand dropped enormously, especially aviation fuel, mm -hmm. because it's a big consumer of fuel. Uh, you know, the automotive industry has been hit by, uh, by COVID to some extent, but people still move and uh, buy cars. So there's been a bit of a drop and a recovery and touch and go. But the aviation, uh, especially international travel, is still down. And so the refineries that are normally making uh, jet fuel um, have cut down. Some of them are closed. Some are, a lot of them have been ramping up all the maintenance work they can do so they should they're in maintenance shut down to to decrease production and and that's has really um uh, you know caused a lot of of damage in the market because um, those refineries making fuel and making base oil paraffinic base oil uh meant that they were going to make less base oil because uh, you can't process crude and only get what you want <laughs> Yeah. You've got to do something with the fuel, obviously. And once all your tanks are full and your customers' tanks are full, you have to stop. So uh, that has put a big clamp on the production of, of um, uh, paraffinic basil, especially the, the Group 1 um, production. Uh, while the naphthanics haven't been impacted directly, but you can imagine that if you've got less Group 1 oil on the market, uh, naphthenic being a good substitute to, to those oil in many applications, the demand for naphthenic has grown. And so there was tightness and there's still some tightness on the naphthenic market as well. Yeah, uh, right. and, that, and we're not talking about all the logistics issues that yeah. uh, we know are around, but we won't go into that. We'll yeah. a very yeah. long <laughs> that continues to plague everyone. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Very, very interesting. No, it's really good to get your insight there. So, um, now, if we if we do go into that uh, properties conversation, mm -hmm. um, yes. maybe if we can talk about, I think people are going to be more generally more familiar with the the paraffinic properties. Yes. So yes, that's right. you know how how are naphthenic base oils um, different in both a mm -hmm. positive way and and in a negative way, you know, okay. for different applications. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And look, I'm going to go back to my molecules. Quickly, I don't want that to be a chemistry lesson. Yeah, yeah, but that's good. It's it's something that that's um, it, it gives you an idea of why uh, a paraffinic. Um, so, 
just first of all, we, we measure, because one of the big difference is on the solvency. Yes. Uh, the solvency as being able to uh, solubilize uh, other products when you mix it with oil. There is a test for that. Um, it's not 100% perfect or reflecting what will happen in your formulation, but it's a good test. It's called the aniline point. And you mix the oil with an equal amount of aniline and uh, you uh, heat them up so they mix well. And then you drop the temperature and you see when they start separating. And so if your oil is very inert and doesn't like mixing with um, aniline, which is a very polar molecule, then it's not going to mix. You know, they separate like oil and water. Uh, whereas if they're close enough, uh, they like to stay together and they'll mix like uh, water and wine. <laughs> so um, I managed to place wine in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so if, and that's all due to electrons. So if you look at this paraffinic structure, the, uh, the electrons distribution uh, in the, um, uh, you know, that's all, as we know, this is all uh, carbon and hydrogen. So those, those angles are all carbons and they all have uh, hydrogen um, on them, etc. Uh, and so the distribution of electron on around the atom is uh, pretty equal, you know, everybody will have uh, the same amount of electrons. Uh, I'm not drawing the number of electrons, by the way, but just to show that it's distributed along the molecule, um, you know, nicely distributed. And that means this molecule um, electronically is uh, is very balanced and so when it meets another molecule um there is no tendency to to want to bond because all those bonds all those miscibility it's all due to molecular forces okay not even talking about chemical reaction just molecular forces why they they mix um and so uh, when you look at the naphthenic uh, obviously in you still have this distribution of electron on the paraffinic chain and here okay but if you look at in terms of density of electrons on the molecule well uh, maybe my ring is a little bit big but th that area will be a bit more dense in electrons because all the atoms are more together and that creates what we call a dipole and the dipole means that it's like a little magnet it's got a north pole and south pole where here it's distributed so well there is there is no polarity or almost none here there is a bit more polarity and it's that polarity, which is kind of uh, similar to, you know, solvency that causes the solvency. So, um, you know, molecules that are alike will, uh, will mix easily. So if you've got polarity, it will mix. If it's not polar, if it's really very polar and non-polar, they're not going to mix very well. Uh, and that's what, what we see. So the, the properties now that you can find from that is that that um, paraffinic molecule is very inert. It's saturated, very inert. There is no ring to break or nothing. So it's actually very oxidation stable. You know, you see, and that's why in engine oil it does so well. Uh, naphthenics are oxidation stable, but you don't put naphthenics in a car engine oil. But it's oxidation stable enough for many l l industrial lubricants, for instance. Mm. Okay, this is not exact science, but I'm yeah, just yeah. trying to picture why you won't find much naphthenics in engine oil. Although you could find some in the additive package because you need the polarity to dissolve the additives. Yeah. Okay, so you, you see where you start to see where you want to use one and not the other. Now, when you go into industrial lubricants, and if we take metal working fluid, for instance, uh, especially emulsions. Uh, we've all seen pictures of metal being cut by a two and you've got this white liquid, uh, uh, you know, on top of it, there is a high flow there to cool and, and to lubricate. It's an emulsion. And in that emulsion, you may have, you know, maybe 5% of oil. I may be wrong, but it's, a, it's a, an emulsion with a lot of water, little oil. But in that oil part, you may have 30% of additives. How do you get 30% of additive in oil? That's not easy, uh, especially certain additives are, don't like to mix too well uh, and can be very thick as well. So it's a lot of effort to mix. But yeah. if they are in an aphthenic oil, they mix a lot better than in a paraffinic oil. Yeah. So it, probably should, that's why some, yeah. Yeah, so probably should also explain just, just in case um, mm -hmm. that 
the reason why most additives won't solvate in a paraffinic is because most additives are polar, right? Exactly. And, and therefore exactly. you need a polar species for it to, to yes. solvate with. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's all about the, that that solubility and uh, or solvency property of the naphthenic. Now, of course, if you go to an aromatic, uh, it will dissolve even better. We all know about aromatic solvent, about that the turpentine uh, you've got at home or other things like this, white spirit, etc. They're very aromatic or even diesel. They will dissolve, uh, you know, a lot of things, but you can use them in lubricant. They oxidize, they evaporate. Um, some of them are carcinogenic. So uh, you, you keep the application uh, limited to, to really uh, some areas. Where, but here we're talking a bit more about lubricants and uh, you know lubricants will be paraffinic and naphthenic. That being said, you can have a small part of aromatic in here, of, of certain aromatics that are, that are okay to have. They will increase a bit the solvency and um, and play a nice little role but you know it will be a few percent we're not talking about the large amount yeah yeah okay maybe um if i can sort of maybe ask a, a question yeah. it's more industry-wide let's mm -hmm. say which is uh when you look at the api base oil groups yes now, recognizing that uh the mineral base oils they're all a mix of these three molecules in to a certain extent right you, you, That's right. In some, in some, you're trying to remove naphthenic ar ar mm -hmm. and aromatic, and in some, you know, maybe less so. Um, but if you looked at the API base oil groups, it's although it's it's not said, but it's group one paraffinic, mm -hmm. group two paraffinic, group three paraffinic, yes, and then group four PAO, which is itself like the king Paraffin of paraffins. Yes, yes, right, uh, and then. Everyone else just gets grouped in as group five, uh, yes. unless you're in Europe. And then I yeah, think uh, PIOs are group six. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's great. So, uh, and, and it's okay if it's, it's, it's your opinion. It doesn't have to be a, a history lesson here. But <laughs> why do you think it is that, that our, our whole conception of base oil and the base oil market mm. is a, around this? It's almost like a pyramid. And, and the top of the tree is... Mm. A race to see how paraffinic you can get right yes, so yes. we kind of put it up on this pedestal well mm -hmm. why do you think that is so i mean the bulk of the volume is driven by engine oils mm. car and truck so pcmo hgdo and one of the key property in there is the viscosity index yeah. with a few other things are like oxidation stability and etc so that group one group two group three group four uh, you know the parameters, it's the, the sulfur content, the, uh, the saturates, and the VI. And, yeah. and really, sulfur content and uh, saturates is not a big deal. Uh, everybody can reach those levels, but um, the, the, the race to the highest possible VI is there. And even in a group four in PAO, you still have different uh, <laughs> VI level. As you would know, you go for metallos in PAO, it's very sharp. Uh, distribution and get a never high, even higher VI. So group one, group one is actually quite similar to naphthenic. It's just that the ratio are different. So in a group one, you'll find paraffinic, naphthenic, and aromatics in there, but in uh, in uh, with a higher ratio of paraffinic. Whereas in a naphthenic oil, uh, you'll have a higher ratio of naphthenic. You'll still have paraffinic and uh, and aromatic. And then technology refining technology evolved, and people starting to make group two and group three, and uh, you've got those unofficial group two plus and group three plus <laughs> to get as close as possible to PAO, while PAO is still uh, getting better and and obviously bringing those uh, those performance. So you have low volatility, you have a high VI, and uh, you have uh, very good oxidation stability, etc. And uh, maybe let's remi remind that uh, the viscosity index basically is a high viscosity index it means that as you heat up your oil it's not going to change viscosity too quickly okay yeah. so from a, a room temperature to an engine running at a at 100 degrees in the outside but in the inside probably higher um, you want to maintain that film thickness to lubricate so you don't want your oil viscosity to drop dramatically when you heat it up all yeah. right uh, and so that's why this high vi is so important that allows you to drop the whole um, 
oil viscosity and hence use less fuel and hence we have the zero w oil etc for engine oil mm. on the other side when you take a naphtanic oil you've got a very low vi now of course when i was in the po business we looked at naphtanic saying oh we can't even it's not worth uh, you know looking at those oils we wouldn't they're not even a competitor their vi is terrible because we had a, a, an automotive engine hmm. uh, mentality. Um, now that I'm on the other side, I hardly ever talk about PAOs because for me, they're into other applications. But why do we want a low VI? Is that good sometimes? Oh, yes. It is excellent in some, especially, for instance, in cooling performance. Hmm. When your oil circulates and eliminate, extract heat, uh, heat away from the, the, the machine, uh, you're happy that the viscosity drops a lot when you heat up the oil because the lower the viscosity, the better the oil will circulate and eliminate heat. So, and that's the case in transformer oil, although for instance, it's not a, a true lubricant, but uh, transformer oil, uh, refrigeration fluid, you, you find a lot of naphtanics in there as well because of their inherent uh, ability to cool easily and heat transfer fluid, the same thing. Uh, it's a matter of transferring heat. So that's another very good property of, of naphtanic oil uh, compared to the the other uh, options. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, there's some really good points that you bring up because uh, one of the, I think, the things that I'm trying to encourage with this channel is the idea that um, aside from if, if something is poorly manufactured, that's a different story. Yeah, but yeah. but there's not really any, there's not really such a thing as, as kind of good lubricants and bad lubricants. In, in my opinion, right? There's there's mm. lubricants that are suitable for your application for purpose, versus exactly. that they're super, suitable for another purpose. And so, um, you know, and, and one of the things that I'd like to get your, your opinion on, mm -hmm. you know, I, I came from the industrial world yeah. um, where for the most part, like a lot of conditions are controlled, especially if you, you're inside a plant, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got a gearbox that's, it's not exposed to ambient temperatures. It's always indoors. Temperature fluctuation is not that big. I've always wondered why we cared so much about the viscosity index. Um, you know, like I was thinking, yeah. let, let's say yeah. in a gear oil, you know, yes. for example, mm -hmm. that it's, you know, a gearbox in an industrial plant, a lot like in some applications, will run at the same speed and the same temperature for 99.5% yes. of its lifetime. Yes. yes. So why do you really care about vi right if you're only ever operating yeah. in one condition exactly so so do you see naphthenic base oils used a lot in industrial applications yes and i would say even more and more right. um you know there is that deformation that mentality around the high vi because it's driven again by automotive and a lot of lubricant companies are across the board of automotive and mm. industrial applications but when i talk to technical managers and I say, well, do you really care about the VI in your industrial application? And they say, well, not really, or at least most of them. Uh, most applications in, in the industrial segment is exactly what you said. Uh, you know, why would you need a, a high VI? And actually, the low VI in some cases, as I mentioned before, will, will bring you a better cooling, which, which you need if you want to run a machine constantly. Uh, you're better off running it at 60 degrees than 80 degrees, for instance. Mm if that, that makes sense. Uh, and so um, another, uh, perhaps, uh, we haven't touched on is uh, greases. And right. uh, naphtanic oil is a, is a premium uh, product for the manufacturing of greases because you get really good low temperature properties uh, thanks to that VI. And in grease, uh, guess what? Pumpability is a key factor. Okay, mm -hmm. especially if you've got centralized uh, lubrication systems where you need to, you know, pump some grease, more grease into your, your machinery, uh, you need that grease to flow. Or when you produce it and you're going to put it into, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, drums or IBCs or some containers uh, as well, you, you need that, that pump, that, that um, grease to, to be pumpable. So you find a great advantage here in, in naphthenic oil that will bring better uh, pumpability and so another uh, interesting property i should say uh, of naphthenic oil is the pore point 
Now, we know paraffinic oils are usually a pretty good pore point, uh, but naphthenic oil have an even lower pore point. And that we can easily understand why, because you have molecules, as I mentioned here, and uh, if you have many molecules of paraffinic, uh, when you cool down a molecule, uh, they all start to stack up. Mm. You know, and they're very easy to stack up, even if there is a bit of branching, uh, because that's just a pure paraffin, but um, uh, normally it's isoparaffinic, so you can't stack them up that well. But anyway, the more they stack up, the, the more easily you can stack up, the higher your pore point. It means that as you drop temperature, you, your product is going to freeze very quickly because the, the molecules can stack up. If your molecules can't stack up, the fluid will stay, the, the, the oil will stay fluid longer. And try to stack up molecules that have all sorts of rings on them. Uh, it, it's very hard. Uh, and so the uh, naphthenic oils are well known for very low pore point. Uh, for instance, in aviation hydraulics, when uh, you fly, you know, typical if you when you're on the plane or when we used to be on planes, you could see the outside temperature minus 55, minus 60. Uh, for the low viscosity naphthenic, that's no problem. They have a pore point that's below minus 70, sometimes minus 80. So that's another interesting temperature um, uh, property, that, that pore point. Uh, perhaps not so critical in many parts of Australia, but around <laughs> the world, uh, you, you have uh, that, that really important property that yeah. can play a, a significant role. Might have to talk to the uh, Australian Antarctic base. Yes, that's right. Well, I have. I have. Oh, right. Uh, yes, yes. For the supply of transformer oil. Of yeah. course, uh, you want to be everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. The, it's, what's interesting about the pore point discussion, I think, is that it, it may, it's a little bit, it's a little bit counterintuitive mm. in, in so much as it's a, it's a geometry problem rather than a necessarily a bonding problem. Because I think, yes. you know, most people would, when they think about freezing points and boil, boiling points, you think about the, in, let me get this right, intermolecular forces. Yes. And, and one of the reasons, let's say, for example, that water freezes at the temperature it does is because it's able to form hydrogen bonds, which is yes. kind of unusual for a molecule of its size. Yes, yes, yes. That's so right. it's funny, using the molecular bonding model, you would actually think that a naphthenic would have a, let me get this right, a higher pore point right because of its polarity oh, okay. I, see. I see what you what right? you're saying because yeah, it should technically polarity, bond yeah. with each with itself better but yeah. due to the fact that geometrically they don't form crystalline structures very that's, well uh that right. gives it the advantage over a paraffin right. water is a very small molecules and and the, the forces between uh, water molecules are very strong mm -hmm. um, because of this hydrogen bond that we all study at school uh, here we're talking about very weak um, London forces or Van der Waal forces uh, between molecules, so they they don't play a role in the, in that sense. It's I think it's it's really geometrical, but I mean, I'm not uh, you know a, an expert. I've studied that a long time ago, so it's maybe slightly trivialized. Uh, you know, uh, there will be some people who can tell you more. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, something else to pick up on. Uh, again, something we've talked about here on this channel before. You talked about the, uh, the the solvency properties, right? Mm -hmm. And specifically with getting additives into solution. Yes. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is plaguing certain industries at the moment is the problem of varnish, mm -hmm. right? And and generally, like let's say for example in the turbo turbo machinery market, yes. that's been uh, a process of them going from turbine oils that used to be group one, yes, paraffinics to now more like your group two, group three paraffinics. Mm -hmm. And although they're more oxidatively stable, when you do get oxidation products, they fall out of solution really, really fast. Yes. And they tend to plate out everywhere because the solvency of the overall package is very low. Yes. So is yes. there a place, uh, let's say for naphthenic base oils, um, I, I'm thinking about, you know, can you use it as almost like a, a, a solvency enhancer, almost like an additive? Yes, I, I see what you mean. Um, look, I'm I'm not too aware about turbines in particular, um, and I'm thinking there is a trade-off between oxidation stability and mm. solvency in that case. 
because if you put uh, an aftanic uh, in a turbine or I'm not too sure or in an, an engine anyway uh, it won't withstand the, the oxidation condition however you've got great um, uh, solvency and so you don't form sludge as easily whereas uh, as you say with a, a group two group three you've got much better stability but then once you start um, uh, oxidizing your product um, it will not keep the oxidation product in solution and hence can form um, you know deposits or sludge or this is a typical case in in transformer oil uh, na- the, most of uh, transformer oil around the world are naphtanic because it's an oil that will oxidize slowly over 10 20 years get darker and darker because all the oxidation oxi- oxidized molecules stay uh, suspended in solution with the oil whereas if you had a, a paraffinic oil you run the risk of forming a sludge mm-hmm. at the bottom of your transformer after a long time so it's exactly the the point you're mentioning you want to bring that solvency with naphtanics but where it's applicable so i think if again if you're in an application that uh, uh, you know high oxidation condition perhaps that's not the best and you use some additives uh, but that being said, in additive package, is, you're likely to find soft naphtanic, some naphtanics as the, 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 the magic uh, uh, link in there to bring the solvency. Because if you put a um, uh, very polar additive into a paraffinic, they won't mix. But if in between you put a bridge, which is a naphtanic oil that mixes with both, then you have a solution and, and the three products mix, mix yeah. well. Uh, and maybe maybe just a comment on the transformer oil as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of is an ideal situation in that it's also generally an enclosed system, right? Yes, that's correct. So that's with correct. a with closed system, you don't have the introduction of as much oxygen, so you're not promoting the oxidation, and they run at lower temperatures than a lot of other applications too, right? So, that's right. So that's, that's why right. you can have an oil that lasts mm. 20 years. Oh, yeah, in, in transformers, 20, 30, 40 years is very common. I mean, you still have to maintain a little bit and, sure. you know, filter your oil, do all certain things. I won't go into detail, but uh, the oil can last a long time because it will, depending on transformers, uh, but a large transformer that is, that is run properly and not overloaded, the oil may be at, at 50 or 60 degrees all its life, uh, hardly ever stops, and it's just a bath. There is no lubrication or any element of, of that destroys the oil except for that slightly high temperature which takes a very long time to oxidize the oil and obviously in a transformer um, what you want is insulation which is in excellent with uh, naphtanic oil and you want the cooling which is excellent as well as I mentioned before uh, and then that solvency so the naft- that, hence why you know, transform oil and naphtanic because they, they, they bring the, the best properties for that application. Yeah. But it's not a lubricant, really. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe just one one last question. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of uh, safety and, and health kind of question, I guess. Yes. Um, you know, are there any safety implications of using an naphtanic? Um, now, I don't personally know of any, but, but like we kind of had a discussion about before, Specifically with the the benzene molecules, mm-hmm. which is more aromatics than than naphtenics. Yeah. Um, the the aromatics kind of have this reputation as uh, you know toxic or carcinogens yeah. or, or or whatever. Yes. But yes. I I think I've heard of naphtenics being used as medical grade oils, right? Or or yes. uh, even yes. food safe. So so yeah, evidently yeah, yeah. there's there's quite a big difference between the two, despite their being both cyclic. Yes. So if if you go to um... Uh, you know, food grade or medical grade naphtanics, you, you'll find hardly any aromatics in them. They've all been removed. Uh, now, that being said, in aromatics, not all aromatics are, are bad for you. Um, so every base oil, you'll find that it's got to uh, uh, have a test uh, called um, the IP346 that has to be below 3% of polyaromatic, um, of uh, polycyclic aromatic PCA less than three percent uh on every specification you you'll you'll find it's the dmso extractable uh ip346 method less than three percent that's the norm um uh, around the industry that is for polycyclic aromatics now if you want to look at really the nasties 
the one that have been proven or highly suspected to be carcinogenic, you're talking about polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. And so those PAHs, um, they're not necessarily always measured or, or looked at. Uh, you've got, however, in Europe legislation called REACH. And um, uh, for instance, uh, Niners makes sure that uh, all their oil are REACH compliant. Mm. That means that you've got, it's probably the strictest uh, around the world uh, in terms of uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. The, the, non, the, the known uh, or suspected carcinogenic, the sum of the eight uh, most undesirable aromatics have to be below 10 ppm. So, it, and one of them has to be below 1 ppm. Oh, so, it, yeah, so it's very strict. Yeah. Okay, we don't have that in, in Australia. I think the, the limit is around 400 ppm, something like right. that. Uh, so, all the, I, I think, um, it depends if you're a European company or not. You know, Niners has to go by that, otherwise, they wouldn't be selling oil in. in uh, uh, in Europe, and that's great for the product that are made elsewhere. Um, I'm not too sure about every uh, naphthalic producer, but that being said, naphthalic base oil are very safe. And you can have those, and they have some aromatic, some paraffinic, some naphthalic blend in there. You could take a, a typical, you know, 22 centi stock um, at 40 degree uh, naphthalic oil. Um, look, from the top of my mind, it would have something like uh, uh, what let's say five percent aromatic or ten percent uh, aromatic and uh, uh, you know forty five percent paraffinic and fifty percent naphthenic for instance Th those kind of of blend uh, and uh, and they're perfectly safe and, and and good now if you want to have a technical white oil you go up in um, uh, I'd say in refining technique and you eliminate more. Aromatics, you may have two percent or one, two, three percent aromatics, and then if you go to a, a medical or food grade white oil, um, uh, naphthenic, you'd have uh, less than 0.1 percent or 0.01 percent. So you have those those uh, naphthenic oil, uh, not so much in the lubricant sector, mm -hmm. but they will be used in uh, in all sorts of uh, industrial applications, from adhesives to uh, to rubber goods and all sort of things yeah cool maybe what like sorry last one last question to sort of end oh, on as, be, as many as you want <laughs> yeah just what, what does uh what does the future of the naphthenic look uh market look like to you uh very interesting um as we touched on before they're in high demand uh the production has been uh, increasing slowly but steadily over the years Whereas if you look at the, um, the paraffinic oil, the group one production is going down. Uh, group two, group three has been increasing because of the demand in engine oil. Uh, but group one going down, a lot of those refineries are old and closing. In Europe, most of them are closed. And now we start to see elsewhere those refining, refineries uh, closing down. Uh, and that means that people still need uh, base oil with some solvency. And guess what? they turn to, to uh, naphthenic oil. And then, you know, they can always blend uh, with other grades, with group two and put naphthenic. So they have uh, uh, those kind of, uh, of properties they're looking uh, for. So naphthenic look, uh, I think, pretty bright for the coming future because they, they're finding more and more applications. Uh, also, where, as I mentioned, the, you know, the range of, uh, of viscosity, so you, you can start at two or three centistokes, and I was mentioning, you know, aviation uh, hydraulics, for instance, or other such applications, but you can go to very heavy ones uh, that we could almost call a naphthenic base stock. They're 400, 600 centistokes, even higher. Uh, and those in industrial application, you were talking about gear oil before, uh, they are in high demand um, because bright stock are disappearing or let's say the uh, because of the closure of group one refineries that are the one mostly making bright stock you have less and less bright stock on the market uh, and then since a lot of the bright stock also goes into industrial lubricants for all the 
you know, the ISO VG grade, you know, 460 or, or those sort of or 300, uh, 200 ISO grades, uh, they need a, a, a high viscosity base oil. And uh, we've seen a lot of naphthenics uh, going into that. So uh, there is, and, and all the middle viscosities are used across the board in lubricants and, and beyond lubricants, as I mentioned, uh, very versatile uh, type of oil because of those properties and especially the solvency. Uh, you use naphthenics to make um, many emulsions in the industrial uh, market, industrial applications. You'll find them into rubber goods, into adhesive, into sedans, into uh, all sorts of applications where uh, paraffinic have been used to some degree, but are not always um, in the, those those extra properties. So I, I think good future for paraffin, for naphthenic oil, definitely. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, Philippe, thank you so much for uh, talking to You're us welcome. today. Uh, I, I thought hope, it was a pretty um, wide-ranging discussion, and I think people yes. get a lot out of it. Yeah, well, hopefully, and if you, I'm sure you might get some comments or questions. I hope I wasn't wrong uh, uh, too often. And uh, but feel free to come back if uh, if you have any any questions or people to reach out to us if uh, they want to know more about that. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Philippe. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Rafa. You take care. Bye.